I would get the comment, gosh, you play really good for a girl. Every once in a while, if I was feeling my oats, I would go up to some fellow drummer who was a boy or a man and say, gosh, you play really good for a boy. <laughs> I've been playing music all my life and loving it and had the most fun doing it and experienced so much joy. Music and drumming is my path. Barbara was an innovator and a pioneer and a risk taker and she led the way for other women drummers. In 1979, the notion of a woman sitting at a drum kit was very new. Here was Barbara Borden playing the kinds of rhythms that we associated with Art Blakey and Max Roach. We were all stunned by the fact that there was a women's jazz band on the scene. And here was Alive with four instrumentalists and a remarkable vocalist. driving the beat from a drum kit. Such complicated polyrhythms in conjunction with what Carolyn Brandy was doing with hand percussion in the congas. It was a rhythm section like none of us had heard before. about the fact that I never saw any women drummers, or rarely. I saw one in the Ina Ray Hutton band that my sisters exposed me to. That was an all women's big band on TV. In my own community and on TV, mostly I just saw guys playing drums. Even on the Mouseketeers, it was Cubby who got to play the drums. Barbara used to pound on pots and pans, and she really wanted a drum set, which my mother was very reluctant to get her. Because, you know, kids have little stages that they go through, and you think, they're not serious about this. And she got this little toy drum. I was five years old. Sears, Roebuck, East LA, walking through the toy department. So shy, so round, chin tucked in and eyes looking down. A little girl in a blue and green check dress she doesn't like. She sees it, a toy drum. She sits down. She starts banging. Mine, 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 mine. Mine! Mine! Barbara was begging, begging to get a drum set. So my mother bought her the drum set, and then she got a drum teacher, and that was it. People often ask Mom, how do you stand her playing the drums in this small house? The noise, the banging, no melody. 
What's to stand, she'd say. It's a lot better than a squeaky violin. <laughs> My practicing in the house wasn't the worst thing Mom was facing. When I was eight, Dad walked out on us. He never said goodbye, and I didn't see him again for nine years. But the love between the four of us helped us carry on. I have so many memories of my mom and my sisters. Like the time that my sisters were working in Las Vegas with Jimmy Durante and Peter Lawford. Every night, we'd go with my sisters to the Desert Inn and sit backstage. It was quite a lot of fun for a 12-year-old. My older sisters, Marilyn and Rosalind, were my heroes. When she got her big drum set, I think she was 10. She really showed the talent at a very young age and we tried to encourage her and feed it, and she just went to town. When I was 12, I joined the first band outside of school, which was called the Silver Tones, and we played for bar mitzvahs and weddings. From that band, a few of us formed a little combo and we played more jazz and standards. And one of the boys was 16. He had a Nash Rambler, and we were able to fit my drum set, an acoustic bass, and all the instruments, and five of us into this car and go across LA to gigs. And I'd get back at two or so in the morning, and my mom was very fine with it. She really trusted me. When I was 19, my dream came true of moving to San Francisco and I just fell in love with the town. I fell in love with North Beach and the jazz clubs and the coffee houses and the beatniks and all that. Heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. I landed this job at a club in North Beach called Crystal Lills. This club had a wax museum of all the famous prostitutes in San Francisco. I was Crystal Lil, the drumming madam, and I wore a strapless gown with a feather bow on top, tight skirt with a slit up the front so my legs could get around the snare drum, blonde wig with a flip, false eyelashes, false everything. It was a hoot. Six weeks after the club opened, it closed. It went bankrupt. and. We didn't get our pay for the week before, and it was just gone. And that just made me remember all the messages that I had gotten. Oh, the music business, you can't count on that. You better have your teaching credential, have some other kind of work that you can do because the music business is very up and down, especially for a woman drummer. And I saw it to be true. So I stopped playing drums. Mm-hmm. I got a job as a medical lab assistant and x-ray technician. I was 24. I thought, oh my goodness, it must be time to get married now. And I found a man who was good looking and sweet enough. And so we got married and that lasted two and a half years. I almost felt that I had abandoned my creative self to fit into the American dream a little more. Detour, wrong road, enough of normal. I had one wild year in that time where I just partied a lot. Drugs, sex, and rock and roll. And at the end of that year, I ended up falling in love with a woman. And it was actually through her and her mom, through their encouragement, that I got back into drumming. And that was the end of my silent period. Oh, 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 oh.
movement and the feminist movement were really beginning to take off. And I was fortunate to be in the San Francisco area at that time because that was a hotbed of women musicians and activists and all of it. The music and the feminist movement bonded together, so what women musicians and performers were singing about were issues that women were dealing with. Being part of the feminist movement empowered me made me feel much more connected to my lineage as a woman and as a woman drummer. In the women's music movement, there were a lot of folk players. There were some really wonderful soul singers. Breaking rocks in the hot sun ain't fun. Breaking rocks in the sun when you're on a run. There were even some rock bands. But there weren't that many jazz players. A group of women named Alive was one of the main groups that brought jazz to women's music. I had heard of them, but I never heard them before I had auditioned with them. But the stories I would hear is, oh my God, these women are wild. They do crazy things. They just jam for hours and they jump off the stage and walk around playing their instruments. And lo and behold, it was all true. <laughs> Well, we needed a drummer, drum set, to get more of a jazz sound. We wanted not just congas, but also that drum set sound. Barbara was playing a, a gig in San Rafael at a studio. She was up on this big stage with these gigantic flowers around her, and she was a big personality. So we interviewed for a piano player and a, and a set drum. We went to their gigs, we watched them play, and uh, Barbara and Janet were the obvious choices. The band wasn't put together as the bands that say, let's make a band, go on the road and make a record and become stars. It was more like, let's get together and play and see where the music takes us. Experimentation can be heard in the group's sound, definitely their own, but one that blends jazz with blues, gospel, swing. Four of the five come from classical music backgrounds, and while it's their music, it's also theirs to give. At that time, we were traveling in a Ford Econoline van. There were five of us, full drum kit, four congas, an acoustic cello, an acoustic stand-up bass, an amplifier. I remember times when we would drive for hours and hours and hours and hours, get to a place, <laughs> unload, do the sound check, do the gig, load up, and drive to the next place. Right. Yeah. We were yeah. young. Yeah. We weren't that Maybe young. That's, we were all in our 30s. Right. Yeah, early 30s. Early 30s. But still, that's a thing you do when you're in your early 20s, usually. <laughs> <laughs> We would go to a lot of festivals, jazz festivals, and, and meet so many other musicians. It was just a very fertile ground for learning and sharing and expanding. When we would play, the fusion of those two drummers, those interlocking rhythms, that is such a powerful experience. A 
Live was so exciting, each and every single member. And just particularly Barbara was so compelling with her smile and her love of playing. I was such an Alive fan. I was her groupie. On a great night, I remember that somehow the energy becomes larger than we are, and the audience on a good night, they pick that up and they amplify that energy. we were. No, it's I've really never cool. had a musical experience like live. Alive was like my musical family. It'll always be a shining star in my life. And then there came a moment when Rhiannon came to the band and said that she wanted to do her own career as a singer. And at the same time, Janet, the piano player, decided that she wanted to have a family and have children, and Carolyn had already gone. So we decided to end the band, but I have to say that it took me 15 years to get over that ending. And there were times when I would be performing She Dares to Drum. After eight passionate years together, Alive died. So did a part of me. The voice of defeat was all I could hear. You'll never find another group like this one. Ha! You can make it on your own as a drummer. Face it, your career is over. I would get to the alive portion and I just burst into tears. I had thought that the band would go on forever. When the band ended, I felt like the ground was taken out from underneath me. I hadn't experienced that kind of sorrow and loss since my father left. Shortly after the end of Alive, we started just playing together. We didn't really know what we were doing, but I had some software and some synthesizers. Sheila Glover and I have known each other about 30 years now. She and her group, Nicholas Glover and Ray, hired me as their drummer in the 80s. And I've been playing with them ever since. Do I 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 do
I made a CD with Sheila called Lady of the Serpent Skirt, which is based on the snake goddess, a Minoan snake priestess. There was a long 20-minute piece that was very exciting for us to compose. We really did feel like we channeled some kind of powerful goddess energy. That awareness of the goddess culture took me to finding that women were the keepers of the drums in those cultures, in those peaceful cultures that sometimes had peace for hundreds of years. It gave me a sense of my roots as a woman. The women were the holders of the drums. They were the drummers. In our time as Cloud9 Music, which was our record label, we did a total of five albums together. There was such joy and permission and creativity. And it was a very special couple of years for both of us. I think that exploration of all of that musical world was really important for Barbara to recover from the loss of a band that I think she thought she would be with forever in a family, a musical family. We performed Lady of the Serpent Skirt at the Playhouse in San Anselmo. The twins brought Barbara's mother to the performance and she sat in the front row and it was the, at the beginning of her memory disorder. And she decided that she knew every song that we sang, and she sang along. So there was a, a loud, constant humming in the <laughs> coming from the front row on all of our New Age <laughs> pieces. And the audience was really great about it. Nobody shushed her. Um, I think everybody knew that it was Barbara's mother and that that was part of the performance. I started teaching drumming, and I started exploring the djembe, which is a hand drum and different African rhythms on djembe. Sometime in the 1990s, I became aware of Barbara's world music drumming. She was exploring rhythms on her albums, All Hearts Beating and Beauty and the Beat. And it was all kinds of percussion drawing on all kinds of ethnic and world music influences and inspirations. She was virtually becoming a one woman percussion orchestra. I met Barbara in the 1980s through a mutual student. I'm always on the lookout for like-minded artists, and I felt a connection immediately. We've worked together for many years on a community event called the Planetary Dance. And every year, Barbara provides the stability of a pulse. Barbara uses her drumming as a instrument of connectedness. For years, Barbara has been drumming with Anna Halpern at the Planetary Dance, and this year she invited me to come play with her. Because it's steel and concrete all around us, the sound was everywhere. And by the time we got through maybe five minutes of playing, there were easily 200 people there because the tourists who were on the street shopping or looking around came up to see what was going on. And 
And it was so infectious, the drumming and the dancing, that they got involved in the ritual too. So these people from Japan and Germany are shouting their prayer and then starting to dance around in these big circles. just this regular little beat. But at the end of it, there was a feeling that came over all of us. And it seems that we just hit a high point. We became all one. It was a communication between us. And it was magic. I first met Barbara in 1998. I had just arrived in the United States, and I went to a storytelling festival that my mom had put together. Barbara came, and she was the drummer there. I was fascinated with drumming, had always been, and wanted to learn how to play it. And then she became my teacher instantly and you know, taught me the basic rudimentary things. And she even allowed me to sit at her drum set <laughs> and whack it a little bit, even though I didn't know what I was doing. I see music and drumming being used to promote a peaceful world, and it's a way to unify people. It has a universal language. When you hit the drum, when you sing a song, the feeling that you throw into the instrument, the feeling that you throw into projecting your voice, reaches people. They can feel it. I think that can be used to really do a lot of good in the world. Barbara has taken her drumming into a different direction, almost the way a shaman might operate. Drumming for healing, drumming to create harmony between people. In today's world, where there is so much hostility, so much killing, so much partisanship, we need to find something in the pulse, in the heart, that will bind us together. We went to the former Yugoslavia on a peace mission together with eight other women called the Doves during the Bosnian War. And performed in refugee camps and for peace groups in the cities. It was a profound experience for all of us. Even before leaving, I was faced with violence, my own. The drum sounds on one of my CDs had frightened our prospective concert producers, reminding them of bombs, bullets, and rockets. So for months, I worked at removing any violence from my drumming inviting the sounds from the drums rather than imposing my will, becoming the drum's lover instead of its master. Barbara's like a drumming diplomat. Wherever we went, as soon as she started playing whatever she was playing, garbage cans or drums, they could feel her communicating with them, her love, her wish to be connected her wish to heal and understand and be understood. It was difficult for the children, this two mile walk. It was probably much worse for the elderly. Anya and I met at a refugee camp outside Zagreb, Croatia. She was 10 years old, thin, blonde, with eyes like a deer.
She grabbed my hand and pulled me to her home, a tiny room filled with bunk beds where she lived with her mother, sister, grandmother, and six others. We sat around a rickety table and talked with our hands and our eyes. I wasn't sure if our laughing made us cry or our crying made us laugh. When it was time to leave, Anya clung to me as her grandmother gave me a white lace doily she had crocheted. In order to really make people understand the need for peace, I think you have to bring them in a space of peace. And how you create that can be through music, which when Barbara does a drumming, she does that quite a lot. Bringing people together, evoking something from them, making them feel a certain thing in your heart. When I had gone through the war as a child who was forced to fight in the war and went through rehabilitation, it was through music that I was able to connect to a time period when this place was peaceful, to relax with the music, to talk about things that happened during the war because the music opened the door. So music had a way to make people reassert their faith in their own humanity again. Once we would see our common humanity, from there arises this desire for us to live together in peace, for us to be able to care for each other. As a drummer, there's a lineage that I feel I've become part of, and one of the origins of this lineage is Africa. I was fortunate enough to be able to visit Africa in the year 2000 to study with an African healer in Zimbabwe. I brought my djembe with me, and I would just drum in the airport in a marketplace. We did many healing rituals and many drumming and dance sessions. We were traveling with the Ananga medicine man, Mendaza Kandemwa. We stopped at a village because there were things to buy. We were looking as tourists, but not Barbara. Barbara went, of course, to look at the drums, and she found a really great drum. I mean, a large drum. Of course, she bought the drum for Mandaza's community. And that was a great gift for everyone. And people brought their drums out, and we were pounding and clapping and drumming and singing, and it went on for a very, very long time. When I drummed in airports, marketplaces, ceremonies, celebrations, this is how I want to drum. When I drummed not as a performer for fame, money, or approval, but as a keeper of the beat in service of the spirits and the community, this is who I want to be. This is who I am. Yes! From the beginning of our relationship, we have collaborated in many, many ways. We collaborated on a wonderful theater percussion piece called She Dares to Drum. Do not retreat from following your spirits. <laughs> 
six years to find your maker, two years to find your body. A dead cottonwood tree gave a piece of its trunk, your shell. A dead cow gave its skin, sound. An artist's inspired hands gave their labor. A community of friends gave their money. So you, heart drum, could be born. When I first received the heart drum, after it was made in New Mexico, we did a ceremony, and then I took the drum to a cave just between Santa Fe and Taos, where I spent a week with the drum. I had told BJ, the maker of the drum, that I was to be the steward of that drum for, I didn't know how long, but for a spell, and then it would move on. The heart drum was a very big spiritual teacher. The heart drum taught me about listening deeply, about community, and how to be with all different kinds of people in larger numbers and be inclusive. Drumming has become a movement. In our culture of high stress and much activity, drumming really brings you to that meditative place. And I do believe that's why so many people are drumming these days. I go one, two, three, four, and then da 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 a lot of her teaching was how to work together with someone. So you build a relationship through the drumming and through the drums. It's not just you drumming, it's you interacting with other people who are drumming and really paying attention to the experience of the other drummers and how it fits together. There's a way that she holds the space and brings joy to all the drumming that's contagious and I think you can feel it in the room. What she taught me was so profound. How to stay present in my body while I'm with somebody else, to keep that fine balance. Anytime I'm on the land, away from the city, I just have a chance to let my body really drop into the natural flow and rhythm of things. And especially when I'm drumming in those sorts of settings and situations, I feel like I really don't need anything else. So whenever possible, I try to do drumming events or workshops or retreats in natural settings because it really helps me as a teacher. It works on people, it relaxes people instantly. The reason why when I first saw Barbara playing that I wanted to take lessons with her, even though I hadn't considered taking lessons ever before, was because she was doing these incredibly complex rhythms while in a state of joy. She was showing me spiritual practice through drumming.
being here in Siberia, in Hakasia, on the land like this, has been a life-altering experience. I became aware of Siberia and shamanism 25 years ago when I saw a photo of a Siberian shaman and his drum. It made a deep impression on me. Siberia is an ancient home of shamanism, and many of the shamans are women. Some of them are keepers of the drum, which they play for ceremonies, healing, and other spiritual work. Shamanism is a very ecological practice because shamans work through nature and through the person's soul. A shaman tells us to live in peace with nature, to eat natural foods, and to love the natural world. Tatiana is just so loving, so open-hearted, so down-to-earth. The minute I saw her, I realized that we were connected deeply. Her main teachings were simple, yet profound. Live simply, love the earth, love others, and honor your ancestors. This comes from many people. The first night that we were here on the land, I presented Tatiana with the drum that I've used for many years that came from Taos, New Mexico, from All One Tribe Drums by the woman who had made the heart drum. People's names on the drum are friends or people that have supported me in my life in some way or another. This is the most precious gift for a shaman, when so many people touch this drum. Imagine its power. When I beat this drum, I'll be thinking that somewhere out there is Barbara and many other people who presented me with this gift. And I'll always be wishing them happiness health, an open heart, and a pure soul. I think I'm going to cry now. And here I am halfway around the world with people I don't really speak the language of, but the language of the heart transcends all that. I'm so grateful that Barbara came here and that it was so magical being together. Now I have a new sister who can play the drum beautifully. Her soul is filled with songs and harmony. From listening to Tatiana drum and sing, and from all the activities and teachings that we've had over these 10 days, I feel strong. And more deeply rooted in the earth and in carrying this kind of web of life, the connectedness of life. And it made my heart open even wider, as wide as all of this. My friend Carolyn Brandy put on a drum camp for women called Born to Drum. At this camp, I met Susie Hawk, a member of the Suquamish tribe, and introduced her to the heart drum. She raised the question about where is the rightful place for a sacred instrument like the heart drum to be. When she came back from the drum camp, she said something really powerful happened, you know. We need to talk about this. It became very clear to me that that drum was to go with Susie. 
and to go to the Suquamish people in the Northwest and be the heart drum there. I could not believe that Barbara could let go of something that meant so much to her. And I said, are you sure you want to do that? She said, absolutely. It's just the right thing. When I told Susie the drum was going to her, I didn't feel like I was losing the drum, but that I was gaining a larger community. This heart drum is going to bring so much joy and so much happiness and so much togetherness and so much knowledge, education. It's got a mission, and I'm just really happy that I get to be a part of it. something that breaks down the barriers with drumming, with drumming from a spiritual place for a spiritual purpose. Barbara could feel how healing and how important this drum would be in that community. I'm just grateful to all of you for being here. So I just thank Susie for putting all this together and all of you for being here and, and this beautiful ceremony for the drum that when uh, I go home, all the people that have loved that drum and me will feel all of you. And I'll always carry you with me. If a drum like this can be used to bring cultures together and hearts together, I can let the drum go as long as I know that's what it's doing. I'm going to tighten that up really good. Yeah. And then let's see if this works now. Sounds good. When the pedal is on, it'll go like that. That's what I meant. Yeah, that's what you meant. Okay. Snare drum stand. Goodness. That's schwitzing. All right, and then this goes on here, like this. What, what a great think? color. Isn't that it cool? It matches your room here. Yeah. Something beautiful. Can we hear some? No. How come? Oh, okay. yeah. Well, they have to all get set up. Yeah. Get right? Right, Lotus? My friendship with Sheila is like family. She and Elaine and Lotus, they're family. Almost immediately, Barbara and baby Lotus fell madly in love with each other. And from a very early age, a lot of this was around drumming and banging on percussion instruments. I'd set some instruments up in my studio for the baby to play on, and she'd play and play, and Barbara would play with her. Barbara gave Lotus a toy drum for her first birthday, and this is before she could walk. And then when she was about three, I think we put her on the drum stool and Barbara showed her how to hold the sticks and she started banging away. And Barbara said, gosh, I think she's, you know, really got a good sense of rhythm here. My first memory of playing the drums with Barbara is with percussion instruments around me and sticks so I could hit everything and then offering the stick to Barbara and then pulling it away. She's the one who really taught me how to play the drums. And I feel grateful that she taught me so well.
Barbara has a big gig coming up that we're all very excited about. We're all a little nervous about because Barbara's going to stretch everyone. And one of the exciting aspects of it is that Lotus is going to be in the band too. And the fact that Barbara and Lotus and I are going to be in the same band together is really a tickle and a hoot.
there is a, a rhythm connected to all of our hearts. And I think that rhythm must continue to go on and somebody must facilitate that. And when I think of Barbara's music, that's what I really see. It's making sure that that doesn't cease, that constant reminder and renewal of our humanity and making sure that we care for each other. There's love and understanding. There's connections to different cultures to find that common ground where all of us meet. That's what the keeper of the beat really is. It's just keeping the, the pulse of our humanity. Ha, ha, ha. 